the sacraments, baptism. The sacrament of baptism. Importance of instruction on baptism. From what has been hitherto said on the sacraments in general, we may judge how necessary it is, to a proper understanding of the doctrines of the Christian faith and to the practice of Christian piety, to know what the Catholic Church proposes for our belief on each sacrament in particular. Whoever reads the Apostle carefully will unhesitatingly conclude that a perfect knowledge of baptism is particularly necessary to the faithful. For not only frequently, but also in language the most energetic, in language full of the Spirit of God, he renews the recollection of this mystery, declares its divine character, and in it places before us the death, burial and resurrection of our Lord as objects both of our contemplation and imitation. Pastors, therefore, can never think that they have bestowed sufficient labor and attention on the exposition of this sacrament. Besides the vigils of Easter and Pentecost, days on which the Church used to celebrate this sacrament with the greatest devotion and special solemnity, and on which particularly, according to ancient practice, its divine mysteries were to be explained, pastors should also take occasion at other times to make it the subject of their instructions. For this purpose a most convenient opportunity would seem to present itself whenever a pastor, being about to administer this sacrament, finds himself surrounded by a considerable number of the faithful. On such occasions, it is true, his exposition cannot embrace everything that regards baptism, but it will then be much easier to develop one or two points when the faithful can contemplate with a pious and attentive mind the meaning of those things which they hear and at the same time see it illustrated by the sacred ceremonies of baptism. Each person, reading a lesson of admonition in the person of him who is receiving baptism, will call to mind the promises by which he bound himself to God when he was baptized, and will reflect whether his life and conduct have been such as are promised by the profession of Christianity. Names of this sacrament In order that the treatment of the subject may be clear, we must explain the nature and substance of baptism, premising, however, an explanation of the word itself. The word baptism, as is well known, is of Greek derivation. Although used in sacred scripture to express not only that ablution which forms part of the sacrament, but also every species of ablution, and sometimes, figuratively, to express sufferings, yet it is employed by ecclesiastical writers to designate not every sort of bodily ablution, but that which forms part of the sacrament and is administered with the prescribed form of words. In this sense the apostles very frequently make use of the word in accordance with the institution of Christ the Lord. This sacrament the Holy Fathers designate also by other names. Saint Augustine informs us that it was sometimes called the sacrament of faith, because by receiving it we profess our faith in all the doctrines of Christianity. By others it was termed illumination, because by the faith which we profess in baptism the heart is illumined, for as the Apostle also says, alluding to the time of baptism, call to mind the former days, wherein, being illumined, you endured a great fight of afflictions Chrysostom, in his sermon to the baptized, calls it a purgation, because through it we purge away the old leaven, that we may become a new paste. He also calls it a burial, a planting, and the cross of Christ, the reasons for all which appellations may be gathered from the epistle to the Romans. Saint Denis calls it the beginning of the most holy commandments, for this obvious reason, that baptism is, as it were, the gate through which we enter into the fellowship of the Christian life, and begin thenceforward to obey the commandments. So much should be briefly explained concerning the name, of this sacrament. Definition of Baptism With regard to the definition of baptism although many can be given from sacred writers, nevertheless that which may be gathered from the words of our Lord recorded in John, and of the Apostle to the Ephesians, appears the most appropriate and suitable. Unless, says our Lord, a man be born again of water and the Holy Ghost, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God, and, speaking of the church, the apostle says, cleansing it by the labor of water in the word of life. Thus it follows that baptism may be rightly and accurately defined, the sacrament of regeneration by water and the word. By nature we are born from Adam children of wrath, but by baptism we are regenerated in Christ, children of mercy. For he gave power to men to be made the sons of God, to them that believe in his name, 
who are born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Constituent Elements of Baptism But define baptism as we may, the faithful are to be informed that this sacrament consists of ablution, accompanied necessarily, according to the institution of our Lord, by certain solemn words. This is the uniform doctrine of the Holy Fathers, as is proved by the following most explicit testimony of St. Augustine, the word is joined to the element, and it becomes a sacrament. It is all the more necessary to impress this on the minds of the faithful lest they fall into the common error of thinking that the baptismal water, preserved in the sacred font, constitutes the sacrament. The sacrament of baptism can be said to exist only when we actually apply the water to someone by way of ablution, while using the words appointed by our Lord. Matter of Baptism Now since we said above, when treating of the sacraments in general, that every sacrament consists of matter and form, it is therefore necessary that pastors point out what constitutes each of these in baptism. The matter, then, or element of this sacrament, is any sort of natural water, which is simply and without qualification commonly called water, be it sea water, river water, water from a pond, well or fountain. Testimony of Scripture Concerning the Matter of Baptism for the Savior taught that unless a man be born again of water and the Holy Ghost, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. The Apostle also says that the church was cleansed by the laver of water, and in the epistle of St. John we read these words, There are three that give testimony on earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood. Scripture affords other proofs which establish the same truth. When, however, John the Baptist says that the Lord will come who will baptize in the Holy Ghost, and in fire, that is by no means to be understood of the matter of baptism, but should be applied either to the interior operation of the Holy Ghost, or at least to the miracle performed on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Ghost descended on the apostles in the form of fire, as was foretold by Christ our Lord in these words, John indeed baptized with water but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. Figures The same was also signified by the Lord both by figures and by prophecies, as we know from Holy Scripture. According to the Prince of the Apostles in his first epistle, the deluge which cleansed the world because the wickedness of men was great on the earth, and all the thought of their heart was bent upon evil, was a figure and image of this water. To omit the cleansing of Nim in the Syrian, and the admirable virtue of the pool of Bethsaida, and many similar types, manifestly symbolic of this mystery, the passage through the Red Sea, according to St. Paul in his epistle to the Corinthians, was typical of this same water. Prophecies With regard to the predictions, the waters to which the prophet Iaias so freely invites all that thirst, and those which as a chill in spirit saw issuing from the temple, and also the fountain which Zachary foresaw, open to the house of David, and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, for the washing of the sinner, and of the unclean woman, were, no doubt, intended to indicate and express the salutary waters of baptism. Fitness The propriety of constituting water the matter of baptism, of the nature and efficacy of which it is at once expressive, St. Jerome, in his epistle to Oceanus, proves by many arguments. Upon this subject pastors can teach in the first place that water, which is always at hand and within the reach of all, was the fittest matter of a sacrament which is necessary to all for salvation. In the next place water is best adapted to signify the effect of baptism. It washes away uncleanness, and is, therefore, strikingly illustrative of the virtue and efficacy of baptism, which washes away the stains of sin. We may also add that, like water which cools the body, baptism in a great measure extinguishes the fire of concupiscence. Chrism added to water for solemn baptism. But it should be noted that while in case of necessity simple water unmixed with any other ingredient is sufficient for the matter of this sacrament, yet when baptism is administered in public with solemn ceremonies the Catholic Church, guided by apostolic tradition, has uniformly observed the practice of adding holy chrism which, as is clear, more fully signifies the effect of baptism. The people should also be taught that although it may sometimes be doubtful whether this or that water be genuine, 
such as the perfection of the sacrament requires, it can never be a subject of doubt that the only matter from which the sacrament of baptism can be formed is natural water. Form of Baptism Having carefully explained the matter, which is one of the two parts of which baptism consists, pastors must show equal diligence in explaining the form, which is the other essential part. In the explanation of this sacrament the necessity of increased care and study arises, as pastors will perceive, from the circumstance that the knowledge of so holy a mystery is not only in itself a source of pleasure to the faithful, as is generally the case with regard to religious knowledge, but also very desirable for almost daily practical use. As we shall explain in its proper place, circumstances often arise where baptism requires to be administered by the laity, and most frequently by women and it therefore becomes necessary to make all the faithful, indiscriminately, well acquainted with whatever regards the substance of this sacrament. Words of the Form Pastors, therefore, should teach, in clear, unambiguous language, intelligible to every capacity, that the true and essential form of baptism is, I baptize thee in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. For so it was delivered by our Lord and Saviour when, as we read in St. Matthew he gave to his apostles the command, going, Teach ye all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. By the word baptizing, the Catholic Church, instructed from above, most justly understood that the form of the sacrament should express the action of the minister, and this takes place when he pronounces the words, I baptize thee. Besides the minister of the sacrament, the person to be baptized in the principal efficient cause of baptism should be mentioned. The pronoun thee, and the distinctive names of the divine persons are therefore added. Thus the complete form of the sacrament is expressed in the words already mentioned, I baptize thee in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Baptism is the work not of the Son alone, of whom St. John says, He it is that baptizeth of the three persons of the blessed trinity together by saying however in the name not in the names we distinctly declare that in the trinity there is but one nature and godhead the word name is here referred not to the persons but to the divine essence virtue and power which are one in the same and three persons essential and non-essential words of the form it is however to be observed that of the words contained in this form which we have shown to be the complete and perfect one, some are absolutely necessary, so that the omission of them renders the valid administration of the sacrament impossible, while others on the contrary, are not so essential as to affect its validity. Of the latter kind is the word ego, I, the force of which is included in the word baptizo, I baptize. Nay more, the Greek church adopting a different manner of expressing the form, and being of opinion that it is unnecessary to make mention of the minister, amidst the pronoun altogether. The form universally used in the Greek churches, let this servant of Christ be baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. It appears, however, from the decision and definition of the Council of Florence, that those who use this form administer the sacraments validly, because the words sufficiently express what is essential to the validity of baptism, that is, the ablution which then takes place. Baptism in the name of Christ. If at any time the apostles baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ only, we can be sure they did so by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, in order, in the infancy of the Church, to render their preaching more illustrious by the name of Jesus Christ, and to proclaim more effectually His divine and infinite power. If, however, we examine the matter more closely, we shall find that such a form omits nothing which the Saviour Himself commands to be observed, for he who mentions Jesus Christ implies the person of the Father, by whom, and that of the Holy Ghost, in whom, He was anointed. And yet, the use of this form by the Apostles seems rather doubtful if we accept the opinions of Ambrose and Basil, Holy Fathers eminent for sanctity and authority who interpret baptism in the name of Jesus Christ to mean the baptism instituted by Christ our Lord, as distinguished from that of John, and who say that the apostles did not depart from the ordinary and usual form which comprises the distinct names of the three persons. 
Paul also, in his epistle to the Galatians, seems to have expressed himself in a similar manner, when he says, As many of you as have been baptized in Christ, have put on Christ, meaning that they were baptized in the faith of Christ, but with no other form than that which the same Saviour our Lord had commanded to be observed. Administration of Baptism What has been said on the matter and form, which are required for the essence of the sacrament, will be found sufficient for the instruction of the faithful, but as in the administration of the sacrament the legitimate manner of ablution should also be observed, pastors should teach the doctrine of this point also. They should briefly explain that, according to the common custom and practice of the church, baptism may be administered in three ways, by immersion, infusion or aspersion. Whichever of these rites be observed, we must believe that baptism is rightly administered. For in baptism water is used to signify the spiritual ablution which it accomplishes, and on this account baptism is called by the apostle a laver. Now this ablution is not more really accomplished by immersion which was for a considerable time the practice in the early ages of the church, then by infusion, which we now see in general use, or by aspersion, which there is reason to believe was the manner in which Peter baptized, when on one day he converted and gave baptism to about three thousand souls. It is a matter of indifference whether the ablution be performed once or thrice. For it is evident from the epistle of St. Gregory the Great to Leander that baptism was formerly and may still be validly administered in the church in either way. The faithful, however, should follow the practice of the particular church to which they belong. Pastors should be particularly careful to observe that the baptismal ablution is not to be applied indifferently to any part of the body, but principally to the head, which is the seat of all the internal and external senses and also that he who baptizes is to pronounce the sacramental words which constitute the form, not before or after, but when performing the ablution. Institution of Baptism When these things have been explained, it will also be expedient to teach and remind the faithful that, in common with the other sacraments, baptism was instituted by Christ the Lord. On this subject the pastor should frequently teach and point out that there are two different periods of time which relate to baptism, one the period of its institution by the Redeemer, the other, the establishment of the law regarding its reception. Baptism instituted at Christ's baptism. With regard to the former, it is clear that this sacrament was instituted by our Lord when, having been baptized by John, he gave to water the power of sanctifying. St. Gregory Natsenzen and St. Augustine Middlegott testify that to water was then imparted the power of regenerating to spiritual life. In another place St. Augustine says, from the moment that Christ is immersed in water, water washes away all sins. And again, the Lord is baptized, not because he had need to be cleansed, but in order that, by the contact of his pure flesh, he might purify the waters and impart to them the power of cleansing. A very strong argument to prove that baptism was then instituted by our Lord might be afforded by the fact the Most Holy Trinity, in whose name baptism is conferred, manifested its divine presence on that occasion. The voice of the Father was heard, the person of the Son was present, the Holy Ghost descended in the form of a dove, and the heavens, into which we are enabled to enter by baptism, were thrown open. Should anyone desire to know how our Lord has endowed water with a virtue so great, so divine, this indeed transcends the power of the human understanding. Yet this we can know, that when our Lord was baptized, water, by contact with his most holy and pure body, was consecrated to the salutary use of baptism, in such a way, however, that, although instituted before the Passion, we must believe that this sacrament derives all its virtue and efficacy from the Passion which is the consummation, as it were, of all the actions of Christ. Baptism made obligatory after Christ's resurrection. The second period to be distinguished, that is, the time when the law of baptism was made, also admits of no doubt. Holy writers are unanimous in saying that after the resurrection of our Lord, when he gave to his apostles the command to go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, the law of baptism became obligatory on all who were to be saved. This is inferred from the authority of the Prince of the Apostles when he says, Who hath regenerated us into a lively hope, 
by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and also from what Paul says of the church, he delivered himself up for it, that he might sanctify it, cleansing it by the labor of water in the word of life. By both apostles the obligation of baptism seems to be referred to the time which followed the death of our Lord. Hence we can have no doubt that the words of the Savior, unless a man be born again of water and the Holy Ghost, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God, refer also to the same time which was to follow after his passion. Reflection If, then, pastors explain these truths accurately, there can be no doubt that the faithful will recognize the high dignity of this sacrament and venerate it with the most profound piety, particularly when they reflect that each of them receives in baptism by the interior operation of the Holy Ghost the same glorious and most ample gifts which were so strikingly manifested by miracles at the baptism of Christ the Lord. Were our eyes, like those of the servant of Elysus, opened to see heavenly things, who can be supposed so senseless as not to be lost in rapturous admiration of the divine mysteries of baptism? When, therefore, the riches of this sacrament are unfolded to the faithful by the pastor, so as to enable them to behold them, if not with the eyes of the body, yet with those of the soul illumined by the light of faith, may we not anticipate similar results. The Ministers of Baptism In the next place, it appears not only expedient, but necessary to say who are ministers of this sacrament, both in order that those to whom this office is specially confided may study to perform its functions religiously and holily, and that no one, outstepping, as it were, his proper limits, may unseasonably take possession of, or arrogantly assume, what belongs to another, for, as the Apostle teaches, order is to be observed in all things. Bishops and priests the ordinary ministers, the faithful, therefore, are to be informed that of those, who administer baptism, there are three gradations. Bishops and priests hold the first place. To them belongs the administration of this sacrament, not by any extraordinary concession of power, but by right of office, for to them, in the persons of the apostles, was addressed the command of our Lord, Go, baptize. Bishops, it is true in order not to neglect the more weighty charge of instructing the faithful, have generally left its administration to priests. But the authority of the fathers and the usage of the church prove that priests exercise this function by their own right, so much so that they may baptize even in the presence of the bishop. Ordained to consecrate the Holy Eucharist, the sacrament of peace and unity, it was fitting that they be invested with power to administer all those things which are required to enable others to participate in that peace and unity. If, therefore, the fathers have at any time said that without the leave of the bishop the priest has not the right to baptize, they are to be understood to speak of that baptism only which was administered on certain days of the year with solemn ceremonies. Deacons Extraordinary Ministers of Baptism Next among the ministers are deacons, for whom, as numerous decrees of the Holy Fathers attest it is not lawful without the permission of the bishop or a priest to administer this sacrament. Ministers in case of necessity Those who may administer baptism in case of necessity, but without its solemn ceremonies, hold the last place, and in this class are included all, even the laity, men and women, to whatever sect they may belong. This office extends in case of necessity, even to Jews, infidels and heretics, provided, however, they intend to do what the Catholic Church does in that act of her ministry. These things were established by many degrees of the ancient fathers and councils, and the Holy Council of Trent denounces anathema against those who dare to say, that baptism, even when administered by heretics, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, with the intention of doing what the Church does, is not true baptism. And here indeed let us admire the supreme goodness and wisdom of our Lord. Seeing the necessity of this sacrament for all, he not only instituted water, than which nothing can be more common, as its matter, but also placed its administration within the power of all. In its administration, however, as we have already observed, all are not allowed to use the solemn ceremonies, not that rites and ceremonies are of higher dignity, but because they are less necessary than the sacrament. Let not the faithful, however, imagine that this office is given promiscuously to all, so as to do away with the propriety of observing a certain precedence among those who are its ministers. 
when a man is present a woman should not baptize, an ecclesiastic takes precedence over a layman, and a priest over a simple ecclesiastic. Midwives, however, when accustomed to its administration, are not to be found fault with if sometimes, when a man is present who is unacquainted with the manner of its administration, they perform what may otherwise appear to belong more properly to men. The Sponsors at Baptism Besides the ministers who, as just explained, confer baptism, another class of persons, according to the most ancient practice of the Church, is admitted to assist at the baptismal font. In former times these were commonly called by sacred writers receivers, sponsors or sureties, and are now called godfathers and godmothers. As this is an office pertaining almost to all the laity, pastors should explain it with care, so that the faithful may understand what is chiefly necessary for its proper performance. Why Sponsors Are Required at Baptism In the first instance it should be explained why at baptism, besides those who administer the sacrament, godparents and sponsors are also required. The propriety of the practice will at once appear to all if they recollect that baptism is a spiritual regeneration by which we are born children of God, for of it St. Peter says, as newborn infants, desire the rational milk without guile. As, therefore, everyone, after his birth, requires a nurse and instructor by whose assistance and attention he is brought up and formed to learning and useful knowledge, so those, who, by the waters of baptism, begin to live a spiritual life should be entrusted to the fidelity and prudence of someone from whom they may imbibe the precepts of the Christian religion and may be brought up in all holiness, and thus grow gradually in Christ, until, with the Lord's help, they at length arrive at perfect manhood. This necessity must appear still more imperative, if we recollect that pastors, who are charged with the public care of parishes have not sufficient time to undertake the private instruction of children in the rudiments of faith. Antiquity of this law. Concerning this very ancient practice we have this noteworthy testimony of Saint Denis, it occurred to our divine leaders, so he called the apostles, and they in their wisdom ordained that infants should be introduced, into the church, in this holy manner that their natural parents should deliver them to the care of someone well skilled in divine things, as to a master under whom, as a spiritual father and guardian of his salvation and holiness, the child should lead the remainder of his life. The same doctrine is confirmed by the authority of hygienists. Affinity contracted by sponsors. The church, therefore, in her wisdom has ordained that not only the person who baptizes contracts a spiritual affinity with the person baptized, but also the sponsor with the godchild and its natural parents, so that between all these marriage cannot be lawfully contracted, and if contracted, it is null and void. Duties of Sponsors The faithful are also to be taught the duty of sponsors, for such is the negligence with which this office is treated in the church that only the bare name of the function remains while none seem to have the least idea of its sanctity. Let all sponsors, then, at all times recollect that they are strictly bound by this law to exercise a constant vigilance over their spiritual children, and carefully to instruct them in the maxims of a Christian life, so that these may show themselves throughout life to be what their sponsors promised in the solemn ceremony. On this subject let us hear the words of Saint Denis. Speaking in the person of the sponsor he says, I promise by my constant exhortations to induce this child, when he comes to a knowledge of religion, to renounce everything opposed, to his Christian calling, and to profess and perform the sacred promises which he now makes. Saint Augustine also says, I most especially admonish you, men and women, who have acquired godchildren through baptism, to consider that you stood as sureties before God, for those whom you received at the sacred font. Indeed it preeminently becomes every man, who undertakes any office, to be indefatigable in the discharge of its duties, and he who promised to be the teacher and guardian of another should never allow to be deserted him whom he once received under his care and protection as long as he knows the latter to stand in need of either. Speaking of this same duty of sponsors, St. Augustine sums up in a few words the lessons of instruction which they are bound to impart to their spiritual children. They ought, he says, to admonish them to observe chastity, love justice, cling to charity, and above all they should teach them the creed, the Lord's Prayer, the Ten Commandments, 
and the rudiments of the Christian religion, who may not be sponsors. It is easy, therefore, to decide who are inadmissible to this holy guardianship, that is, those who are unwilling to discharge its duties with fidelity, or who cannot do so with care and accuracy. Wherefore, besides the natural parents, who, to mark the great difference that exists between this spiritual and the carnal bringing up of youth, are not permitted to undertake this charge, heretics, Jews and infidels are on no account to be admitted to this office, since their thoughts and efforts are continually employed in darkening by falsehood the true faith and in subverting all Christian piety. Number of Sponsors The number of sponsors is limited by the Council of Trent to one godfather or one godmother, or at most, to a godfather and a godmother, because a number of teachers may confuse the order of discipline and instruction and also because it was necessary to prevent the multiplication of affinities which would impede a wider diffusion of society by means of lawful marriage. Necessity of Baptism If the knowledge of what has been hitherto explained be, as it is, of highest importance to the faithful, it is no less important to them to learn that the law of baptism, as established by our Lord, extends to all, so that unless they are regenerated to God through the grace of baptism, be their parents Christians or infidels, they are born to eternal misery and destruction. Pastors, therefore, should often explain these words of the Gospel, unless a man be born again of water and the Holy Ghost, he cannot enter into the Kingdom of God. Infant Baptism, Its Necessity That this law extends not only to adults but also to infants and children, and that the Church has received this from apostolic tradition is confirmed by the unanimous teaching and authority of the Fathers. Besides, it is not to be supposed that Christ the Lord would have withheld the sacrament and grace of baptism from children, of whom he said, Suffer the little children, and forbid them not to come to me, for the kingdom of heaven is for such, degree whom also he embraced, upon whom he imposed hands, to whom he gave his blessing. Moreover, when we read that an entire family was baptized by Paul, it is sufficiently obvious that the children of the family must also have been cleansed in the saving font. Circumcision, too, which was a figure of baptism, affords strong argument and proof of this practice. That children were circumcised on the eighth day is universally known. If then circumcision, made by hand, in despoiling of the body of the flesh, was profitable to children, it is clear that baptism, which is the circumcision of Christ, not made by hand, is also profitable to them. Finally, as the Apostle teaches, if by one man's offense death reigned through one, much more they who receive abundance of grace, and of the gift, and of justice, shall reign in life through one, Jesus Christ. If, then, through the transgression of Adam, children inherit original sin, with still stronger reason can they attain through Christ our Lord grace and justice that they may reign in life. This, however, cannot be effected otherwise than by baptism. Pastors, therefore, should inculcate the absolute necessity of administering baptism to infants, and of gradually forming their tender minds to piety by education in the Christian religion. For according to these admirable words of the wise man, a young man according to his way, even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Infants receive the graces of baptism. It may not be doubted that in baptism infants receive the mysterious gifts of faith. Not that they believe with the assent of the mind, but they are established in the faith of their parents, if the parents profess the true faith, if not to use the words of Saint Augustine then and that of the Universal Society of the Saints, for they are rightly said to be presented for baptism by all those to whom their initiation in that sacred rite is a source of joy, and by whose charity they are united to the communion of the Holy Ghost. Baptism of infants should not be delayed. The faithful are earnestly to be exhorted to take care that their children be brought to the church, as soon as it can be done with safety, to receive solemn baptism. Since infant children have no other means of salvation except baptism, we may easily understand how grievously those persons sin who permit them to remain without the grace of the sacrament longer than necessity may require, particularly at an age so tender as to be exposed to numberless dangers of death. Baptism of Adults With regard to those of adult age who enjoy the perfect use of reason, persons, namely, born of infidel parents, 
the practice of the primitive church points out that a different manner of proceeding should be followed. To them the Christian faith is to be proposed, and they are earnestly to be exhorted, persuaded and invited to embrace it. They should not delay their baptism unduly. If converted to the Lord God, they are then to be admonished not to defer the sacrament of baptism beyond the time prescribed by the church. For since it is written, delay not to be converted to the Lord, and defer it not from day to day, they are to be taught that in their regard perfect conversion consists in regeneration by baptism. Besides, the longer they defer baptism, the longer are they deprived of the use and graces of the other sacraments, by which the Christian religion is practiced, since the other sacraments are accessible through baptism only. They are also deprived of the abundant fruits of baptism, the waters of which not only wash away all the stains and defilements of past sins, but also enrich us with divine grace which enables us to avoid sin for the future and preserve righteousness and innocence, which constitute the sum of a Christian life, as all can easily understand. Ordinarily they are not baptized at once. On adults, however, the Church has not been accustomed to confer the sacrament of baptism at once, but has ordained that it be deferred for a certain time. The delay is not attended with the same danger as in the case of infants, which we have already mentioned, should any unforeseen accident make it impossible for adults to be washed in the salutary waters, their intention and determination to receive baptism and their repentance for past sins, will avail them to grace and righteousness. Nay, this delay seems to be attended with some advantages. And first, since the Church must take particular care that none approach this sacrament through hypocrisy and dissimulation, the intentions of such as seek baptism, are better examined and ascertained. Hence it is that we read in the decrees of ancient councils that Jewish converts to the Catholic faith, before admission to baptism, should spend some months in the ranks of the catechumens. Furthermore, the candidate for baptism is thus better instructed in the doctrine of the faith which he is to profess, and in the practices of the Christian life. Finally, when baptism is administered to adults with solemn ceremonies on the appointed days of Easter and Pentecost only greater religious reverence is shown to the sacrament. In case of necessity adults may be, baptized at once. Sometimes, however, when there exists a just and necessary cause, as in the case of imminent danger of death, baptism is not to be deferred, particularly if the person to be baptized is well instructed in the mysteries of faith. This we find to have been done by Philip, and by the Prince of the Apostles, when without any delay, the one baptized the eunuch of Queen Candace, the other, Cornelius, as soon as they expressed a wish to embrace the faith. Dispositions for Baptism Intention the faithful are also to be instructed in the necessary dispositions for baptism. In the first place they must desire and intend to receive it, for as in baptism we all die to sin and resolve to live a new life, it is fit that it be administered to those only who receive it of their own free will and accord, it is to be forced upon none. Hence we learn from holy tradition that it has been the invariable practice to administer baptism to no individual without previously asking him if he be willing to receive it. This disposition even infants are presumed to have, since the will of the Church, which promises for them, cannot be mistaken. Insane, delirious persons who were once of sound mind and afterwards became deranged, having in their present state no wish to be baptized are not to be admitted to baptism, unless in danger of death. In such cases, if previous to insanity they give intimation of a wish to be baptized, the sacrament is to be administered, without such indication previously given it is not to be administered. The same rule is to be followed with regard to persons who are unconscious. But if they, the insane, never enjoy the use of reason, the authority and practice of the Church decide that they are to be baptized in the faith of the Church, just as children are baptized before they come to the use of reason. Faith Besides the wish to be baptized, in order to obtain the grace of the sacrament, faith is also necessary. Our Lord and Saviour has said, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Repentance Another necessary condition is repentance for past sins and a fixed determination to avoid all sin in the future. Should anyone desire baptism and be unwilling to correct the habit of sinning, he should be altogether rejected. 
for nothing is so opposed to the grace and power of baptism as the intention and purpose of those who resolve never to abandon sin. Seeing that baptism should be sought with a view to put on Christ and to be united to him, it is manifest that he who purposes to continue in sin should justly be repelled from the sacred font, particularly since none of those things which belong to Christ and his church are to be received in vain, and since we well understand that, as far as regards sanctifying and saving grace, baptism is received in vain by him who purposes to live according to the flesh, and not according to the Spirit. As far, however, as the sacrament is concerned, if the person who is rightly baptized intends to receive what the church administers, he without doubt validly receives the sacrament. Hence, to the vast multitude who, in compunction of heart, as the scripture says, asked him and the other apostles what they should do, the prince of the apostles answered, Do penance and be baptized every one of you, and in another place he said, Be penitent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. Writing to the Romans, St. Paul also clearly shows that he who is baptized should entirely die to sin, and he therefore admonishes us not to yield our members as instruments of iniquity unto sin, but present ourselves to God as those who are alive from the dead. Advantages to be derived from these reflections. Frequent reflection upon these truths cannot fail, in the first place, to fill the minds of the faithful with admiration for the infinite goodness of God, who, uninfluenced by any other consideration than that of his mercy, gratuitously bestowed upon us, undeserving as we are, a blessing so extraordinary and divine as that of baptism. If in the next place they consider how spotless should be the lives of those who have been made the objects of such munificence, they cannot fail to be convinced of the special obligation imposed on every Christian to spend each day of his life in such sanctity and fervor, as if on that very day he had received the sacrament and grace of baptism. Effects of Baptism To inflame the minds of the faithful, however, with a zeal for true piety, pastors will find no means more efficacious than an accurate exposition of the effects of baptism. The effects of baptism should be frequently explained, in order that the faithful may be rendered more sensible of the high dignity to which they have been raised, and may never suffer themselves to be cast down therefrom by the snares or assaults of Satan. First Effect of Baptism, Remission of Sin They are to be taught, in the first place, that such is the admirable efficacy of this sacrament that it remits original sin and actual guilt, however unthinkable its enormity may seem. This was foretold long before by Ezechiel, through whom God said, I will pour upon you clean water, and you shall be cleansed from all your filthiness. The Apostle also, writing to the Corinthians, after having enumerated a long catalogue of sins, adds, Such you were, but you are washed, but you are sanctified. That such was at all times the doctrine handed down by Holy Church is clear. By the generation of the flesh, says St. Augustine in his book on the baptism of infants, we contract original sin only, by the regeneration of the Spirit, we obtain forgiveness not only of original, but also of actual sins. St. Jerome also, writing to Oceanus, says, all sins are forgiven in baptism. To remove all further doubt on the subject. The Council of Trent, after other councils had defined this, declared it anew, pronouncing anathema against those who should presume to think otherwise, or should dare to assert that although sin is forgiven in baptism, it is not entirely removed or totally eradicated, but is cut away in such a manner as to leave its roots still fixed in the soul. To use the words of the same Holy Council, God hates nothing in those who are regenerated, for there remains nothing deserving of condemnation in those who are truly buried with Christ by baptism unto death, who walk not according to the flesh but putting off the old man, and putting on the new, who is created according to God, become innocent, spotless, pure, upright, and beloved of God. Concupiscence which remains after baptism is no sin. We must confess, however, that concupiscence, or the fuel of sin, still remains, as the Council declares in the same place. But concupiscence does not constitute sin, for, as St. Augustine observes, in children who have been baptized the guilt of concupiscence is removed, the concupiscence itself, remains for probation, and in another place he says, the guilt of concupiscence is pardoned in baptism, 
but its infirmity remains. For concupiscence which is the effect of sin is nothing more than an appetite of the soul in itself repugnant to reason. But if it is not accompanied by the consent of the will or by negligence, it is very far from being sin. When Saint Paul says, I did not know concupiscence, if the law did not say, Thou shalt not covet, he speaks not of concupiscence itself, but of the fault of the will. The same doctrine is taught by Saint Gregory when he says, If there are any who assert that in baptism sin is but superficially effaced, what could be more untrue than their statement? By the sacrament of faith the soul, entirely freed from sin, adheres to God alone. In proof of this doctrine he has recourse to the testimony of our Saviour who says in St. John, He that is washed, needeth not but to wash his feet, but is clean holy. Further proof of the first effect of baptism. Should anyone desire a striking figure and image, of the efficacy of baptism, let him consider the history of Neman the Syrian leper, of whom the scriptures inform us that when he had washed seven times in the waters of the Jordan he was so cleansed from his leprosy that his flesh became like the flesh of a child. The remission of all sin, original and actual, is therefore the peculiar effect of baptism. That this was the object of its institution by our Lord and Saviour is clearly stated by the Prince of the Apostles, to say nothing of other testimonies, when he says, do penance and be baptized every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. The second effect of baptism, remission of all punishment due to sin. In baptism not only is sin forgiven, but with it all the punishment due to sin is mercifully remitted by God. To communicate the efficacy of the Passion of Christ our Lord is in effect common to all the sacraments. But if baptism alone does the Apostle say, that by it we die and are buried together with Christ. Hence Holy Church has always understood that to impose those works of piety, usually called by the Holy Father's works of satisfaction, on one who is to be cleansed in baptism, would be injurious to this sacrament in the highest degree. Nor is there any discrepancy between the doctrine here taught and the practice of the primitive Church, which of old commanded the Jews, when preparing for baptism, to observe a fast of forty successive days. The fast thus imposed, was not enjoined as a work of satisfaction, but those who had received baptism were thus admonished to devote some time to the uninterrupted exercise of fasting and prayer in honor of so great a sacrament. Baptism does not exempt from penalties of the civil law. Although the remission by baptism of the punishments due to sin cannot be questioned, we are not to infer that it exempts an offender from the punishments decreed by civil tribunals for some grave crime. Thus a person sentenced to death is not rescued by baptism from the penalty ordained by the law. We cannot, however, too highly commend the religion and piety of those rulers who remit the sentence of the law, that the glory of God may be the more strikingly displayed in his sacraments. Baptism remits the punishment due to original sin after death. Baptism also remits all the punishment due to original sin after this life, for through the merit of the death of our Lord we are able to attain this blessing. By baptism, as we have already said, we die with Christ. For if, says the Apostle, we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Baptism does not free us from the miseries of life. Should it be asked why immediately after baptism we are not exempt in this mortal life from misfortunes and restored by the influence of this sacred ablution to that state of perfection in which Adam, the father of the human race, was placed before his fall, the answer will be that there are two chief reasons for this. In the first place we who by baptism are united to, and become members of Christ's body, should not be more honored than our head. Now Christ our Lord although clothed from his birth with the plenitude of grace and truth, was not divested of human infirmity which he assumed, until, having suffered and died, he rose to the glory of immortality. It cannot appear extraordinary, therefore, if the faithful, even after they have received the grace of justification by baptism, are clothed with frail and perishable bodies until, having undergone many labors for the sake of Christ, and having closed their earthly career, they are recalled to life and found worthy to enjoy with him an eternity of bliss. The second reason why bodily infirmity, 
disease. Sense of pain and motions of concupiscence remain after baptism is that in them we may have the seed and material of virtue from which we shall hereafter receive a more abundant harvest of glory and more ample rewards. When, with patient resignation, we bear all the trials of life, and, aided by the divine assistance, subject to the dominion of reason the rebellious desires of the heart, we ought to cherish an assured hope that if, with the apostle we shall have fought a good fight, finished the course, and kept the faith, the Lord, the just judge, will render to us on that day a crown of justice which is laid up for us. Such seems to have been the divine plan with regard to the children of Israel. God delivered them from the bondage of Egypt, having drowned Pharaoh and his hosts in the sea, yet he did not conduct them immediately into the happy land of promise, he first tried them by a variety and multiplicity of sufferings. And when he afterwards placed them in possession of the promised land and expelled the previous inhabitants from their native territories, yet he left a few other nations whom the Israelites could not exterminate, in order that his people might always have occasion to exercise fortitude and warlike courage. We may add that if, to the heavenly gifts with which the soul is adorned in baptism, were joined temporal advantages, there would be good reason to doubt whether many might not approach baptism with a view to obtain such advantages in this life, rather than the glory to be hoped for in the next, whereas the Christian should always propose to himself, not these delusive and uncertain goods which are seen, but the solid and eternal ones which are not seen. Baptism a source of happiness to the Christian even in this life. This life, however, although full of misery, does not lack its pleasures and joys. To us, who by baptism are engrafted as branches on Christ's what could be more pleasing or desirable than, taking up the cross upon our shoulders, to follow him as our leader, fatigued by no labor, retarded by no danger, in ardent pursuit of the rewards of our high vocation, some to receive the laurel of virginity, others the crown of teaching and preaching, some the palm of martyrdom, others the honors appropriate to their respective virtues. These splendid titles of exalted dignity none of us should receive, had we not contended in the race of this calamitous life and stood unconquered in the conflict. Third effect of baptism, grace of regeneration. But to return to the effects of baptism, it should be taught that by virtue of this sacrament we are not only delivered from what are justly deemed the greatest of all evils, but are also enriched with invaluable goods and blessings. Our souls are replenished with divine grace, by which we are rendered just and children of God and are made heirs to eternal salvation. For it is written, He that believeth and is baptized, shall be saved, and the Apostle testifies that the church is cleansed by the labor of water in the word of life. Now according to the definition of the Council of Trent, which under pains of anathema we are bound to believe, grace not only remits sin, but is also a divine quality inherent in the soul, and, as it were, a brilliant light that effaces all those stains which obscure the luster of the soul, investing it with increased brightness and beauty. This is also a clear inference from the words of Scripture when it says that grace is poured forth, and also when it usually calls grace, the pledge of the Holy Ghost. Fourth Effect of Baptism, Infused Virtues and Incorporation with Christ this grace is accompanied by a most splendid train of all virtues, which are divinely infused into the soul along with grace. Hence, when writing to Titus, the Apostle says, He saved us by the labor of regeneration and renovation of the Holy Ghost, whom he hath poured forth upon us abundantly, through Jesus Christ our Savior. Saint Augustine, in explanation of the words, poured forth abundantly, says, that is, for the remission of sins and for abundance of virtues. By baptism we are also united to Christ, as members to their head. As therefore from the head proceeds the power by which the different members of the body are moved to the proper performance of their respective functions, so from the fullness of Christ the Lord are diffused divine grace and virtue through all those who are justified, qualifying them for the performance of all the duties of Christian piety. Why the practice of virtue is difficult even after baptism? Though we are thus supported by a powerful array of virtues, it should not excite our surprise if we cannot, without much labor and difficulty, undertake, or at least, perform acts of piety and of moral virtue. If this is so, it is not because the goodness of God has not bestowed on us the virtues from which these good works proceed, 
but because there still remains after baptism a severe conflict of the flesh against the spirit, in which, however, it would not become a Christian to be dispirited or grow faint. Relying on the divine goodness we should confidently hope that by a constant habit of leading a holy life the time will come when whatever things are modest, whatever just, whatever holy, will also prove easy and agreeable. Let these be the subjects of our willing consideration, the objects of our cheerful practice, that the God of peace may be with us. Fifth Effect of Baptism, Character of Christian By baptism, moreover, we are sealed with a character that can never be effaced from the soul. On this point, however, we need not speak at length, for what we have already sufficiently said on the subject, when treating of the sacraments in general, may be applied here. Baptism not to be repeated. Since on account of the nature and efficacy of this character it has been defined by the church that this sacrament is on no account to be reiterated, pastor should frequently and diligently admonish the faithful on this subject, lest at any time they may be led into error. This doctrine is taught by the apostle when he says, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Again, when exhorting the Romans, that being dead in Christ by baptism they should take care not to lose the life which they had received from him, he says, in that Christ died unto sin, he died once. These words seem clearly to signify that as Christ cannot die again, neither can we die again by baptism. Hence the Holy Church also openly professes that she believes one baptism. That this agrees with the nature of the thing and with reason is understood from the very idea of baptism, which is a spiritual regeneration. As then, by virtue of the laws of nature, we are generated and born but once, and, as Saint Augustine observes, there is no returning to the womb, so, in like manner, there is but one spiritual generation, and baptism is never at any time to be repeated. In conditional baptism the sacrament is not repeated. Nor let anyone suppose that it is repeated by the church when she baptizes anyone whose previous baptism was doubtful, making use of this formula, If thou art baptized, I baptize thee not again but if thou art not yet baptized, I baptize thee in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. In such cases baptism is not to be considered as impiously repeated, but as holily, yet conditionally, administered. In this connection, however, there are some matters, in which, to the very great injury of the sacrament, abuses are of almost daily occurrence, and which therefore demand the diligent attention of pastors. For there are not wanting those who think that no sin is committed if they indiscriminately administer conditional baptism. Hence if an infant be brought to them, they think that no inquiry need be made as to whether it was previously baptized, but proceed immediately to baptize the child. Nay more, although they be well aware that the sacrament was administered at home, they do not hesitate to repeat its administration in the church conditionally, making use of the solemn the ceremonies of the church. This certainly they cannot do without sacrilege and without incurring what theologians call an irregularity. According to the authority of Pope Alexander the conditional form of baptism is to be used only when after due inquiry doubts are entertained as to the validity of the previous baptism. In no other case is it ever lawful to administer baptism a second time, even conditionally. Sixth Effect of Baptism, Opening the Gates of Heaven Besides the other advantages which accrue to us from baptism, the last, to which all the others seem to be referred, is that it opens to us the portals of heaven which sin had closed against us. Effects of Baptism Foreshadowed in the Baptism of Christ these effects which are wrought in us by virtue of baptism are distinctly marked by the circumstances which, as the Gospel relates, accompanied the baptism of our Saviour. The heavens were opened and the Holy Ghost appeared descending upon Christ our Lord in the form of a dove. By this we are given to understand that to those who are baptized are imparted the gifts of the Holy Spirit, that to them are opened the gates of heaven. The baptized, it is true do not enter heaven immediately after baptism, but in due season, when they shall have been freed from all misery which is incompatible with a state of bliss, they shall exchange a mortal for an immortal life. Measure in which those effects are obtained. These are the fruits of baptism, which, if we consider the efficacy of the sacrament, are, no doubt, 
equally common to all, but if we consider the dispositions with which it is received, it is no less certain that all do not share to the same extent in these heavenly gifts and graces. Ceremonies of Baptism Their Importance It now remains to explain, clearly and concisely, what is to be taught concerning the prayers, rites, and ceremonies of this sacrament. To rites and ceremonies may, in some measure, be applied what the Apostle says of the gift of tongues, that it is unprofitable to speak, unless the faithful understand. They present an image, and convey the signification of the things that are done in the sacrament, but if the people do not understand the force and meaning of these signs, there is but little advantage derived from ceremonies. Pastors should take care, therefore, to make them understood and to impress the minds of the faithful with a conviction that, although ceremonies are not of absolute necessity, they are of very great importance and deserve great veneration. This the authority of those by whom they were instituted, who were, no doubt, the apostles, and also the object of their institution, sufficiently prove. It is manifest that ceremonies contribute to the more religious and holy administration of the sacraments, serve to place, as it were, before the eyes the exalted and inestimable gifts which they contain, and impress on the minds of the faithful a deeper sense of the boundless beneficence of God three classes of ceremonies in baptism. In order that the pastor's instructions may follow a certain plan and that the people may find it easier to remember his words, all the ceremonies and prayers which the church uses in the administration of baptism are to be reduced to three heads. The first comprehends such as are observed before coming to the baptismal font, the second, such as are used at the font, the third, those that usually follow the administration of the sacrament. Ceremonies that are observed before coming to the font, consecration of baptismal water. In the first place, then, the water to be used in baptism should be prepared. The baptismal font is consecrated with the oil of mystic unction, not, however, at all times, but, according to ancient usage, only on certain feasts, which are justly deemed the greatest and the most holy solemnities in the year. The water of baptism was consecrated on the vigils of those feasts, and on those days alone, except in cases of necessity, it was also the practice of the ancient church to administer baptism. But although the church, on account of the dangers to which life is continually exposed, has deemed it expedient to change her discipline in this respect, she still observes with the greatest solemnity the festivals of Easter and Pentecost on which the baptismal water is to be consecrated. The person to be baptized stands at the church door. After the consecration of the water the other ceremonies that precede baptism are next to be explained. The persons to be baptized are brought or conducted a to the door of the church and are strictly forbidden to enter, as unworthy to be admitted into the house of God, until they have cast off the yoke of the most degrading servitude and devoted themselves unreservedly to Christ the Lord and His most just authority. Catechetical Instruction the priest then asks what they demand of the church, and having received the answer, he first instructs them in the doctrines of the Christian faith, of which a profession is to be made in baptism. This the priest does in a brief catechetical instruction, a practice which originated, no doubt, in the precept of our Lord addressed to his apostles, Go ye into the whole world, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. From this command we may learn that baptism is not to be administered until, at least, the principal truths of our religion are explained. But as the catechetical form consists of many interrogations, if the person to be instructed be an adult, he himself answers, if an infant, the sponsor answers for him according to the prescribed form and makes the solemn promise, the exorcism. The exorcism comes next in order. It consists of words of sacred and religious import and of prayers, and is used to expel the devil, to weaken and crush his power. The salt. To the exorcism are added other ceremonies, each of which, being mystical, has its own clear signification. When, for instance, salt is put into the mouth of the person to be baptized, this evidently means that, by the doctrines of faith and by the gift of grace, he shall be delivered from the corruption of sin, 
shall experience a relish for good works, and shall be delighted with the food of divine wisdom. The sign of the cross. Next his forehead, eyes, breast, shoulders and ears are signed with the sign of the cross, to declare, that by the mystery of baptism, the senses of the person baptized are opened and strengthened, to enable him to receive God, and to understand and observe his commandments. The saliva. His nostrils and ears are next touched with spittle, and he is then immediately admitted to the baptismal font. By this ceremony we understand that, as sight was given to the blind man mentioned in the Gospel, whom the Lord after he had spread clay on his eyes commanded to wash them in the waters of Silo, so through the efficacy of holy baptism a light is let in on the mind, which enables it to discern heavenly truth. The ceremonies observed after coming to the font. After the performance of these ceremonies the persons to be baptized approach the baptismal font, at which are performed other rites and ceremonies which present a summary of the Christian religion. The Renunciation of Satan Three distinct times the person to be baptized is asked by the priest, Dost thou renounce Satan, and all his works, and all his pomps? To each of which he, or the sponsor in his name, replies, I renounce. Whoever then, purposes to enlist, under the standard of Christ, must first of all, enter into a sacred and solemn engagement to renounce the devil and the world, and always to hold them in utter detestation as his worst enemies. The Profession of Faith Next, standing at the baptismal font, he is interrogated by the priest in these words, Dost thou believe in God, the Father Almighty? To which he answers, I believe. Being similarly questioned on the remaining articles of the creed, he solemnly professes his faith. These two promises contain, it is clear, the sum and substance of the law of Christ. The wish to be baptized. When the sacrament is now about to be administered, the priest asks the candidate if he wishes to be baptized. After an answer in the affirmative has been given by him, or, if he is an infant, by the sponsor. The priest immediately performs the salutary ablution, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. As man, by yielding the assent of his will to the wicked suggestions of Satan, fell under a just sentence of condemnation, so God will have none enrolled in the number of his soldiers but those whose service is voluntary, that by a will and obedience to his commands they may obtain eternal salvation. The Ceremonies That Follow Baptism chrism. After the person has been baptized, the priest anoints the crown of his head with chrism, thus giving him to understand, that from that day he is united as a member to Christ, his head, and engrafted on his body, and that he is, therefore, called a Christian from Christ, as Christ is so called from chrism. What the chrism signifies, the prayers then offered by the priest, as St. Ambrose observes, sufficiently explain. The White Garment on the person baptized the priest then puts a white garment saying, Receive this white garment, which mayest thou carry and stain before the judgment seat of our Lord Jesus Christ, that thou mayest have eternal life. Instead of a white garment, infants, because not formally dressed, receive a white cloth, accompanied by the same words. According to the teaching of the fathers this symbol signifies the glory of the resurrection to which we are born by baptism, the brightness and beauty with which the soul, when purified from the stains of sin, is invested in baptism, and the innocence and integrity which the person who has received baptism should preserve throughout life. The Lighted Candle A lighted taper is then put into the hand of the baptized to signify that faith, inflamed by charity which is received in baptism, is to be fed and augmented by the exercise of good works. The name given in baptism. Finally, a name is given the person baptized. It should be taken from some person whose eminent sanctity has given him a place in the catalogue of the saints. The similarity of name will stimulate each one to imitate the virtues and holiness of the saint, and, moreover, to hope and pray that he who is the model for his imitation will also be his advocate and watch over the safety of his body and soul. Wherefore those are to be reproved who search for the names of heathens, especially of those who were the greatest monsters of iniquity, to bestow upon their children.
By such conduct they practically prove how little they regard Christian piety when they so fondly cherish the memory of impious men, as to wish to have their profane names continually echo in the ears of the faithful. Recapitulation This exposition of the sacrament of baptism, if given by pastors, will be found to embrace almost everything which should be known regarding this sacrament. We have explained the meaning of the word baptism, the nature and substance of the sacrament, and also the parts of which it is composed. We have said by whom it was instituted, who are the ministers necessary to its administration, who should be, as it were, the tutors whose instruction should sustain the weakness of the person baptized, to whom baptism should be administered, and how they should be disposed, what are the virtue and efficacy of the sacrament. Finally, we have developed, at sufficient length for our purpose, the rites and ceremonies that should accompany its administration. Pastors should recollect that the chief purpose of all these instructions is to induce the faithful to direct their constant attention and solicitude to the fulfillment of the promises so sacredly made at baptism, and to lead lives not unworthy of the sanctity that should accompany the name and profession of Christian.